Wanna be like on my knees in the night, say a prayers in the street light. <laughs> no. Uh, breakfast? Oh, yes, please. Look at the situation. Ain't got to face him. I was raised by the same. So my guy said, Man, this is a team. Hello? It didn't get through. The uh, coke hit. It didn't go through. What all of this? Yeah, all 500 fucking kilos. Customs found the lot. Fuck oh, sake, Stephen. Be as quick as you can. Yes. Don't forget your run bag. Right. Okay. Yeah, go, go, go. Life of an international drug smuggler, Stephen. Pretty much. Some people say a man is made out of mud. A poor man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood and skin and bones. A mind that's weak and a back that's strong. You load 16 tons. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in depth. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go I owe my soul to the company store Liverpool, today it has a drug culture to rival that of any inner city area in Britain Associated gang rivalry and shootings have led to heavy policing there. Much of the blame for all that can be laid on the burly shoulders of 34-year-old Curtis Warren, arrested after a raid on a warehouse. Investigators discovered cocaine with a street value of £75 million. Once known as Interpol's Target One, Warren led a gang who for years had flooded Europe with heroin, cocaine, ecstasy and hashish. One of his lieutenants, Stephen Nee, has been on the run from Britain since 1993, after escaping a 22-year drug smuggling sentence. Certain smells, especially the Colombian coffee that I have, that, always, that smell always took me back to a place in Colombia. Describe your life. How would you describe my life? Yeah. Comedy of errors, I suppose. It's been a life of struggle, I suppose, all the way. It's the same in all poor areas that if you've not got enough food, what do you do? For me, that was the beginning. Shoplifting in Tesco. How old were you? I was about nine, yeah. Coming up to nine, eight, nine. My mum was, uh, she was always poorly. She used to send us for a few quid to supermarket. And God help us if we didn't come back with the food. We used to have to either steal it or get a bit of an hiding when we got home. I rubbed my own primary school when I was nine. I don't know what made me do it, but I took a tin full of money. I uh, went to the local shop, bought a big toll roll with it. I 
by the time I got home, everybody knew the school had been robbed and knew it was me. Not a very glamorous start, is it? So, yes, you've got to start somewhere, haven't you? How do you, someone from Newton Heath, get into drug smuggling? Well, quite a lot of people that I knew at the time was, was smoking cannabis. So it was a natural thing for me anyway. I put a couple of grand together and we decided to go to Holland to buy some cannabis. £5,000 for a couple of days' work. That lit up everything in my mind. Uh, it took us less than a week to go back and buy two and do the same again. Cocaine just seemed like a natural progression at the time. You don't see it as a drug, you just see it as a commodity. That's all it was to, to us. I know it did all the damage it did, and thinking about the time, you don't, you're not thinking like that. These officers are searching for ecstasy tablets. They estimate some 15 million pounds worth of illegal tablets has been prevented from reaching the streets. The legacy, I think, of ecstasy was that it laid the grounds for what became the cocaine market. Ecstasy got the youth audience used to partaking in an illegal activity. And once you've breached that barrier, it's then a short step to buying this powder. I mean, in the 80s, it was just too expensive for, 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 for more, you know, for normal people, yeah. for working class people. We had speeds, you see. We had yeah. amphetamine sulfates. So what changed? The quantity, the amount that was coming the in. The price. And the price. The price went down. The more you've got, the more easily as to get older, the cheaper it is, more people use it. Is it fair to say that the, the cocaine started flooding the city at that point? Oh, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> It was like similar what coming up to when he was like. Give you that confidence, made you feel good, made you feel like you take on anything. And I, I liked what it done for me. I did it like I liked the way it made me feel. I started taking it like daily. I'd have a brekkie in the morning, and, and then me and my mates would go and get some. So we'd end up like a uh, Oni all the time. The thing is, if you weren't doing cocaine yourself and you were sitting with a group of cocaine that users, it was quite hilarious actually, because they just start chatting bubbles. Just talking yeah. shit. Just talking shit, yeah. We know somebody that went off on one when he was on coke. He actually picked up one of these to threaten someone. A fish slice. <laughs> a fish slice. <laughs> Cocaine for me was all about like sleep through the day, up all night in nightclubs, snorting with the lads, telling the bouncers to piss off. You were supercharged and you were like, yeah, whatever, come on. And it was like, whoa, this is brilliant. Every minute of the day, a plane touches down. Unbeknown to the airlines, they're carrying more and more drug smugglers into this country. The guys who arrived with the explosion of the cocaine trade were simply there to make, make their fortune. Customs officers have targeted a flight from Bogota, Colombia, a country notorious for cocaine production. The money that could be made in trafficking cocaine was astronomical. Inside is £300,000 worth and this attracted a whole new breed of drug smugglers. These guys had a different mentality. They were hungrier, tougher, much more violent. With more and more guns available on the street and more and more people apparently prepared to use them, the fear is that summer in this particular city will be a heated, tense time. The result was that a lot of the people who'd been involved in cannabis and even ecstasy trafficking suddenly bailed out because this wasn't their world. They couldn't compete.
Can I help you, ladies? Dean, hey! Nice outfit! So it was you who raided Barry Manilow's wardrobe? Says the grown man in the fluffy tracksuit. Now, less of the chit chat, Boris Becker. Show me the merchandise. Monkeys. Chimpanzee. Whoa, 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 calm down, girls. It's the first ever drug deal. Carry on like this and it'll be your last. I told you we're good, didn't I? Direct from Columbia. Stephen, my lad, it's game, set and match. Cut! Cut there. Is that how you do a drug deal, Stephen? No, there's nothing like how you do a drug deal. You do a drug deal with no guns, no suits, no flash cars, no nothing. As quiet as possible. What about the chit-chat? No chit-chat at all. Straight to the point and gone. It did feel a bit wrong, to be honest with you. Hmm. The first time that I started dealing with cocaine was when I got the opportunity to, to carry some through customs. I had to travel to Ecuador. People that I knew knew people there. They put 24 kilo in a case. And that was all that was in the case, was cocaine. And then at the airport on this side, it was down to just taking the risk of uh, getting it through. So you went through customs with 24 kilos of cocaine in the bag and nothing else? Well, I had a bit of foam around it. Oh, well, that makes a difference. Yeah. What do you call that? It's a uh, kamikaze. You either get through or you don't. There's no in between. I was smartly dressed. Just looked like a businessman. As you're going through, you just try not to look at anybody. Just keep walking. Any sort of sniff a dog would, I would imagine, pick it up, even though it was covered in uh, stuff to... Stop that. What was it covered in? The mustards, pickle lilies. Sorry, what? Oh, Mustard, pickle lily. Pickle lily. Pickle lily. Well, I was only a, a, like a mule, really. You're just taking maximum risk. But I didn't get caught. I got through with mine and I got uh, three kilo for my kamikaze. How much did you make on that deal? Close to. Uh, 60 for it, got the money, got the 60,000 for it, got back. And even on the way back, we got a phone call off and wanted more. That's how good it was. It was, well, straight from Colombia. So I was making a fortune. HM Customs are now convinced the drug barons of Colombia are targeting Britain, using neighbouring countries as loading points. Drug barons are in business to make money, and so Britain and the rest of Western Europe are very much in the target. Liverpool gangsters talk to people in South America. Cut out the middleman and just import your own. Someone like Curtis Warren, his rise in the drugs trade was sudden and meteoric. And that was because he managed to forge links with the cocaine cartel in, in Colombia and then would organise the transport into the UK which allowed him to get it at the, for the cheapest prices. And as a result of this, he became one of the biggest cocaine dealers in the UK. There was more of it than I'd ever known. It just seemed to be like everyone was selling coke then. I was talking to the head of the drug squad at the time that coke was becoming a real issue within the city. And I said, if we don't start doing some intervention, there's going to be gun battles in the streets. And he just kind of looked down at me and he went, Lynn, this is Britain, not America. And then three months later? Three months later, there was gun battles on the street. Police struggling to stop a vicious drug war as armed gangs fight it out to control the lucrative backstreet drug trade. Local people are too terrified to come forward with police left with no alternative. 
but to fight force with force. In Liverpool, alongside the growth in, in cocaine, there was a real explosion of violence. Yeah. Were you aware of that? I was always aware that it was there, but it's down at the street level. Like I say, I was always away from it, but... but the whole game's covered in violence, isn't it? It's not... You can't say your hands are clean of the violence because you didn't take part of it. Do you feel culpable? I did, I, yeah. Yeah, I know people have, have suffered through what I did. I am responsible for things that happened. Wherever there's cocaine, there's going to be violence. Whether it's people committing crime to get money to buy cocaine, or whether people willing to go to any lengths to protect what they've got. Uh, the money involved. Because of the money involved, yeah. <laughs> So what were you spending at the height in a week on code? Say a few grand. A few grand a week? Yeah. It got them going out enjoying it to being on my own in the house with the telly on mute and not being too loud. Um, and looking at reflections in the window of myself, thinking there was someone outside. That was the Charlie scene, you know, snorting coke off samurai swords and having weapons and no enemies, that kind of stuff. He's just really, really paranoid. Could they had a pin drop two miles away, you know, that kind of feeling. You know, like, shh, 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 shh. Do you hear that? That was in that. Are we being socks this stuff, me? <laughs> Paranoid, you know what I mean? Thinking the neighbours are talking about me, listening through walls, getting all surveillance equipment, you know what I mean? You bought surveillance equipment? I did, yeah. Night vision goggles and everything. <laughs> Look out this little window and I'd see people walking dogs and getting on with their life, and that was all I wanted was to be a part of the human race. But I had no love, no family, no friends, nothing. Here on the roof of Latin America is the home of that so called elegant aristocrat of the drugs world, cocaine. People lose their fortunes and sometimes their lives in pursuit of its beguiling properties. There's thousands of tons of cocaine in South America. How do you get it from there to here? Transport's the key. This Belgian lad was moving stuff all over the place. And I jumped in with a 40 kilo one for him from Curaçao. And he started asking about for couriers to, uh, to pick up in, in Curaçao, and he, he got some couriers interested in it, but there was undercover police. And that's when we got caught for the 6.3 kilo and 40 kilo of cannabis. We got arrested and uh, went to Risley on remand. The trial was four or five months. Every day I go to court, handcuffed to the same guy. Same guy on the trial with me. We were found guilty and I knew I was looking at a long stretch. 22 years, my barrister had told me. That's when I decided I had to escape. So me and my mate made a plan. We would escape during transit on the day of the sentencing. Only on that day, for the first time ever, I'm not handcuffed to him. But some totally new guy.
Obviously, my mind is racing now. Have I been found out? And I thought, ah, oh, fuck it. Something's gonna happen in a minute. That's not what happened. It said armed escape. It's not what happened, mate. This is what happens. what happened. So how come it says armed escape on your record? You tell me. So I'm on the run for a very serious crime. I've got 22 years in my absence. And I've got to start earning money private plane over to uh, Holland, got off the plane there and went to a flat right in the centre of Amsterdam. And it was a few months before I, I made contact again with Curtis. I met Curtis Warren while I was in prison. He was there waiting for his trial to go ahead. Well, what was he on trial for? Uh, cocaine, 500 kilo of cocaine, importation. When customs men torched open these lead drums, they found nearly a ton of high-grade cocaine in concealed compartments. Before his arrest, Warren was referred to by Interpol as Target One. It's claimed he was dealing in every type of illegal drug from all around the world. When I met Curtis for the first time, he was just another prisoner to me. Once I started talking to him, I realised that he'd done more or less in the, in the drug game what I, I was doing, been to the same places I'd been to. And me and him got on quite well. I used to be able to get Curtis out onto the wing for a few hours, or I could go in his cell and play chess or something, you know, have a chat. And then later on, when I'd already escaped, not too sure about what happened, but his trial collapsed completely. Newspaper reports have claimed the problem was a lack of coordination between the police and customs and excise. And then all of a sudden, he was out, made contact with him and uh, started up with him. We started doing what we did. Sorry, mostly into Europe. Definitely moved up quite a few steps in, on the ladder. There were bigger deals and bigger transactions and, and possibilities. There's always possibilities as well with Curtis. You could go to bed broke and wake up a millionaire because the ship could come in. If it's coming in a container, a transport company will come and pick it up and you get it delivered to your premises. People used to come over and, and pay fortunes in suitcases. And one bloke came over and he had 1.6, I think it was, million in fivers and tenors and twenties. It took us days to count it. It's when you, when you see it all in, in one place, it's... Uh, that's when I suppose you get the feeling that you're getting somewhere. It's just international business. 
moving tens of millions of pounds worth of stuff about, and the stuff was cocaine. When you, you take away all the, the goods and the bads and the evil and all that, it's just a product, isn't it? He's taking it from one point to another. That's how we seen it at the time. We all believe in good. But what's the opposite of that? Evil? Yeah. And I think... You know, if there is a devil, I really believe that he has a crack pipe in his hand. Five and a half kilos of freshly produced, highly addictive crack cocaine. With its cheaper street value and high addiction rates, cracks identified as the drug of the 90s. Crack cocaine was the game changer for me. You know, using crack, it was like falling off a cliff. He smashed me at pieces. In this, in this high-rise block here, I used to smoke crack in there. It was a 24-7 open crack house. I used to come here a lot. What I've found when I've been using drugs is I hit a rock bottom and I get a shovel and start digging and finding a new one. And that's what it, what it was like taking crack. It's like having 20 lines at once, but lasts a fraction of the time. The crack cocaine is very, very Moorish, so you need more and more money. And then you're committing more and more crimes and the desperation level goes higher. So your moral compass goes to cash converters. Then from buying it to making it. Put it in a spoon. Put it under the flame. Goes yellow on top. That's how easy it is. If you turn one gram into ten rocks, how long would that last? It would be me and me mate, so not long. Half an hour. Half an hour? Yeah. Half an hour. And then we'd be buying more coke. An heroin addict might go and buy heroin twice, three times a day tops, whereas a crack cocaine user might go 15 times a day. So there's more money involved. And then the competition between the dealers as well. So the violence associated with a drug use, it, it, it just, you know, it went, it went off the scale. Five people have been shot in just two incidents. Scores are settled in full-scale gun battles. With police in danger of losing control, high-profile armed officers have now been sent onto the streets of Toxteth. Operation Crayfish began when the first prosecution against Curtis Warren had collapsed. Customs met senior police officers to form a joint team tasked with attacking the top level of Merseyside drug importation and distribution. Curtis Warren and co had assumed that they were safe from phone taps in Holland, that the British didn't know where they were and that nobody would be tapping their phones over there. But investigators had identified that Warren was in the Netherlands. They informed the Dutch and they asked the Dutch if they would be prepared to commence a target operation against Warren. They agreed and got the authorization to uh, tap their telephones. The Dutch thought that uh, they were listening to a foreign language. It certainly wasn't Dutch and it certainly wasn't English in their mind. 
just just to, uh, to listen to a scouser. I mean, I have difficulty listening to scousers, and, and uh, so they heard a conversation about I sort of see at the cafe by us. So they thought the name of the cafe was by us. Well, it's by us, you know, by near me. You've got the intelligence team, and they spend hours and hours looking for a cafe that doesn't exist. Also, they were struggling because they couldn't understand backslang. What is backslang? Something's developed by school kids in the yard, and it's basically breaking down a word, and you add letters to it. So my name is Steve. In backslang, it'd be Stabiv, or Stabiv, or Stabiv. How would you say my name is Steve, and I used to be in the police force? My another game is Stabiv. Uh, I was in the Paris Paragos. No, I didn't get that at all. No. They could hear in conversation gliders, so they thought that the enterprise were going to use gliders to bring the, the drugs into the UK, and it's actually they're backslanging gilders. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they were a month into it before they said, well, I "Give up, don't know what they're saying, haven't got a clue." I was at home. I had, I had a, a, a week's vacation decorating in the front room and I had a phone call to say uh, on, on Sunday you're flying to Holland and that's that's the first I knew about it. I was picked because I can speak backslide <laughs> and I, I, I knew the players on a daily basis we were getting fresh intelligence the, the, the telephone was so active there was over 14,000 telephone conversations that we listened to Ah, that's a, that's a lot of telephone conversation. And it's not, it's not listening to a conversation like you and I. It's an intense conversation with back slang, with rhyming slang. You know, your, your insides are tight. There's a knot in your stomach. And you've got to make sure that you get it right because you're passing that intelligence to the team. And they want to act on it. We didn't know it was Steve and me, but when you're here, someone is sent to Colombia to meet the Cali cartel. Now, there's not that many drug dealers who do that. You know, when, you, when you hear that, you know, you know that this guy is big. Steve and me was now helping to arrange what was probably the biggest cocaine deal ever into the UK. Meetings arranged for me to, uh, to go meet a bloke called Lucho, who was part of the Cali cartel in the middle of Colombia. That's where he had his house. It was over hundreds of thousands of acres of land. I flew over it a few times. When I flew over it, we seen the bull ring in the middle, a full-size professional bull ring made out of stone. And around it was scattered 12 houses, properly extravagant. Ten bedrooms, same amount of bathrooms. Then he took us to the to the horses, they had literally hundreds of stables. And he also had a full-size tiger, a full-size chimp. But the chimp was enormous. His head was bigger than mine. The chimp uh, took a liking to me instantly for some reason and jumped on me. When you got a full-size chimp on your chest, and it's screaming its head off at you. I was absolutely terrified. Yeah, I'm terrifying them chimps. So no, I was more scared of the chimp than I was of Lucho. One evening, Steve and me called Curtis Warren from Colombia. Curtis was watching a movie, uh, Goldeneye. I think it did, it did just come out in 96. Uh, Steve and me was telling him that he's met with the Cali cartel. He said, it's, uh, it's absolutely fantastic. He said, there's, I'm in this big mansion. He says, there's lots of women. He said, and there's, there's cocaine everywhere. He said, it's, it's fantastic. Curtis Warren really wasn't interested. Okay, yeah, I'm watching the movie. <laughs> Did he mention anything about a monkey? He 
Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. Now you mentioned it. So Steve and me talks about that there's loads of women, there's lots and lots of cocaine everywhere, there's, uh, there's a stupid monkey that's getting the shit out of me. And then they talk about they've brokered a deal. Half a ton, half a ton of cocaine. I'm listening, but I'm telling the team, it's on, it's on. The whole team are euphoric. To us, it, it was a massive result. You know, we're listening to a guy who's in Colombia talking to Curtis Warren about a drug deal and masses and masses of cocaine. You know, it's just, that's, you, you, you could work in an interception suite for 30 years as a police officer and probably never hear that. You do lie to yourself a lot as a, a drug dealer. The amount of times I thought, oh, they can't fail. But they always come. They never come when you've got very little. When you've got loads and they come. In the early hours of the morning, the Dutch police decided to strike Curtis Warren's house. Consequently, they recovered masses of drugs, masses of firearms, grenades, CS gas, and the 400 and odd kilos of cocaine in Rotterdam. Warren and his gang were finally arrested after a raid on a warehouse at Rotterdam docks. Investigators discovered cocaine with a street value of 75 million pounds. Once known as Interpol's Target One, Warren led a gang who for years had flooded Europe with heroin, cocaine, ecstasy and hashish. One of his lieutenants, Stephen Mee, has been on the run from Britain since 1993, after escaping a 22-year drug smuggling sentence. In Holland, when they come for you, it's not the police who come. They're called the arrest artist squad and they're ex-military. It was done within seconds, really. Blew the windows out, flashbangs went in, and the stun grenades went in. Face downwards, naked, we're being carried, hands and feet, across the gravel into the back of the car. Devastating, obviously. Because when they do come, when you're at that level, you know that you're gone for decades. When they arrested me, I was on a false name. It took them three months to realise from my fingerprints who I was. found out who it was. The Dutch, here from the English police, had escaped with, apparently, an armed gang with machine guns and rocket launchers. What the fuck? That's not what happened. That's why they moved me to a triple cat A prison for seven years. the end result of being an international drug smuggler. This is how it always ends, like this. I think I'm an armed, dangerous escapee from England. We're on our way now to a triple cat prison. And after everything else, this is how it really ends. We've now got at least eight years of closed visits, strip searches every day. And all the time, on your own. And that's it. There's no way out of it. 
the end of the road. This is where you fall off the end of the planet. And don't come back for a long time. Fuck. There was a point when I was in Colombia and we, we got on uh, a big catamaran. I got to use it for a few months and that's when I started, I think, realising that this could be the life for me once I've got enough money. I thought I needed millions to keep going and really I didn't. Should have stopped. Should have stopped a long, long time ago. You become like a shadow in, in people's lives. You float in and out of it. You're never really part of it. And even now, because of it, I'm the same still. I always feel like I'm looking in. If you want to be lonely, be a drug dealer. That's what you'll end up with. A lot of time on your own. You can't tell a story about Liverpool without talking about crime. Our take on crime is always going to be very different because we grow up with it. Our story is unique. We are a unique people. We are different. We are entrepreneurs in our nature because we're survivors, whether that be from exporting our cultural heritage to exporting or importing drugs. There's no real difference. We do what we do. But we're clever as a people, and I think that's why we've excelled in the drugs trade for so long, because we have an ingenuity which other people don't, and we have a toughness inherent in us which other people don't as well. Combine them things, it's a very powerful force. And uh, that's why people don't like to fuck with us, I think. Some people say a man is made out of mud. A poor man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood and skin and bones. A mind that's weak and a back that's strong. You load 16 tons. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in depth. I owe my soul to the company store.